I'm really happy to see you all here and all bright-eyed and everything. I was with the FBI for 20 years, and uh, I've been doing uh, presentations about this topic at different schools for, for, for a while uh, at this point. But I, I know it's a Friday, and I know it's kind of you know, late in the week and everything, so I'll, you, know, you might be kind of getting to the point where you don't want to pay too much attention, but this is really important, so I want you to stay closely, uh, pay close attention to this. In fact, I really want you to stay engaged, all right? So this is how you stay engaged uh, when someone's talking to you. This is how you stay engaged. I've had plan to protect small business owners, local officials, the high sheriff is with us today. I'm worried about the quality of the education of the community in this group. They can receive federal support for their work. Okay, so try to be more engaged than that. I know you will be, and I, I know I'm not the president, but uh, I want you to pay attention to this. So speaking of presidents, uh, does anybody in the room know Who's our 26th president of the United States? Howard Cap. Close, but not correct. Yes. Roosevelt. Which, which one? Theodore. Correct. Very good. You're the first one that got that right of the three classes I've talked to uh, so far. Teddy Roosevelt was the first uh, 26th president, 26th president of the United States. And Teddy Roosevelt had a lot of good quotes. And one of them I want you to remember, he said this, believe you can and you're halfway there. What he's really talking about is if you want to achieve something in life and you all will have dreams at some point in your life, maybe you do already about what you want to achieve, what you want to do, but the first part of doing that is to believe you can do it. Once you can believe you can do it, then you can achieve it. And I believed I wanted to become an FBI agent and I knew I could do it back in my, when I was about your age. In fact, when I was about your age, I watched a television show that was on every Sunday night and it was all about the FBI. And that's, this show convinced me that I, to become an FBI agent. So let me just give you a flavor for this, how this show started. This is the beginning of that show that was on Sunday nights on the ABC television network. Warner Brothers production, starring Ephraim Zimbalist, Jr. Don't you love those modern graphics, the way that uh, Washington Monument kind of floats into the picture there? I thought that was really, really cool when I was growing up. So watching that show made me want to become an, uh, an FBI agent. And then uh, later in life, so just you know, several years later, when I, after I went to college, after I went to graduate school and I had some work experience, I got hired by the FBI. And the first thing you do when you get hired by the FBI is you go to Quantico, Virginia, where they have training for FBI agents. So we do things like shooting weapons. We learn how to do that. We learn how to handcuff people when we make arrests, just like police officers might do when they go to training. And we learn all about these things. So when we come out in the field and we're able to uh, do those things effectively, this is actually a true story it happened right here in Kansas City, and it happened uh, in Olathe, Kansas. This guy robs a bank, and he goes into the bank with a shirt that said, show me the money on it, with his head, uh, the, his head covered in the, in the, in the ski, cat, ski mask, you can see. And then not only does he rob the bank, but he takes hostages, and he goes down to an airport, gets out of the car, and tries to get on a plane where he's going to make his escape flying a plane. He's a pilot, and he's going to fly a plane. And we asked him later, why? What was your plan for escape? Why did you do that? And he said, I was going to fly around the bank until the heat was off. And he was going to land on a golf course and drive off in his car. Was he thinking clearly? No. He was a little bit crazy, right, to do that? How do you think we treated him when we arrested him and the police arrested him? How do you think he was treated? Raise your hand. Anybody? How do you think he was treated? Like he was stupid? No, nope, not really. <laughs> See, he was being very cooperative, and we treated him with respect like we would anyone else. He wasn't like us. He was a little strange. He was a criminal. We were at the FBI. The police were there, and he was totally different than us. doesn't mean we treat him any differently. We treat him with respect. And now, if he started to do something, like he tried to fight, or maybe he pulled the gun, or maybe he was uncooperative, it might have been a little different. But most people, it's much better to treat with respect in life, because you're going to get a lot more of what you want when you're treating people with respect as well. And besides that, it's just a kind thing to do. And we treat him with respect, and he went to jail. That doesn't change anything. Just because he's weird, we still treat him with dignity. People want to be treated with dignity. So let's fast forward a few years uh, later and, and talk about this. So when was the year that the Internet first started being used by people like you and me, just everybody? What year do you think it was? 2004. You're a little bit, little bit past it. What, what, anybody else? Yeah. 
Yeah, closer. It was actually 1995 or so that the internet was starting to be used in a mainstream way by all of us. And uh, this is a cartoon from that year that was in a magazine called New Yorker Magazine. And the cartoon says on the internet, as you can see, no one knows you're a dog. What does this mean? What's the message in this cartoon? You can be anybody and that you can trick your identity online. You can be anybody you want online. You could trick people into, th into uh, thinking, uh, convincing them you're someone else. But also, more important than that, what's so easy to do online? Lie. You can lie online. Right. You can lie online and, and not have any really consequences because you think and maybe people don't know who you are, but the truth of the matter is we can find out, anyone can find out who you are online for the most part. And lying is not, so, not such a nice thing to do online. You know, in the, even in the FBI, when people lie in person, sometimes people are really, really good liars. And if we can't tell if someone's lying or not in person, we might pull them on a polygraph machine, have a lie detector test. If we do that, here's what an example of a lie detector test looks like in the FBI. Now we're going to run a few tests. This is a simple lie detector. I'll ask you a few yes or no questions, and you just answer truthfully. Do you understand? Yes. <laughs> Homer Simpson is not a very good liar, right? He can't get even past the first question on the lie detector test. Mm -hmm. But the truth of the matter is, when people go online, they tend to uh, uh, think they can lie uh, and say things that really aren't true. And that's not something you should do because, again, it's unrespectful and, and it's not, it doesn't show a lot of dignity when you lie about people online. I'll ask you another question here. Who is this guy? Yep. Mark Zuckerberg. Mark Zuckerberg. And what is his claim to fame? Yep. He invented Facebook. He started Facebook. In fact, uh, in 2010, he was named the uh, person of the year of Time Magazine because he really changed the way that we communicate. Now, there were social networking sites before that. You may have heard of something called MySpace, which is still around today. But Facebook kind of changed everything. People adopted Facebook. And today, as of January 1st, 2012, Facebook says they have not 845 million people that are registered users on Facebook. More people than live not just in the United States, which is only 310 million people, but in the whole continent of North America. So we have lots of people on Facebook. It's really become a phenomenon. And a lot of people communicate using Facebook. Um, Facebook, by the way, is so addicting, so addicting that this guy who's a criminal, your everyday criminal, breaks into a house in the state of West Virginia, and while he's in the house burglarizing it, he can't resist the temptation to go log into his Facebook page on the victim's computer and update his Facebook status. He typed this in, oh my gosh, laugh out loud, breaking into someone's house. That was his Facebook update, right? And so he typed in, uh, oh my gosh, is OMG, you know that, and LOL, the Z on the end of LOL, that's the plural of laugh out loud. So what was he doing a lot of? Laughing, laughing out loud in the plural form, a lot of it, right? But he didn't realize that uh, he, the joke was actually on him. When he logged into the victim's computer and that little box was checked that he didn't notice that said keep me logged in. So when he left the victim's house, he X'd out of Facebook, didn't log out of Facebook. And when the victim came home, she filed her police report right about her stolen jewelry and then she got on her computer and up comes Facebook and whose Facebook page was open on her computer it's the guy who robbed her house so she called the police I know who robbed my house here's his Facebook page right here so then she sent him a friend request just for the heck of it no she didn't really send him a friend request uh, these guys uh, actually all wanted by the FBI mostly from foreign countries they were running scams on the computer to rip people off one guy on the screen had a picture taken of him his uh, friend took a picture of him holding a hundred dollar bills, lots of hundred dollar bills, and he posted it on his Facebook page. And that's how the FBI uh, was able to catch him, by the way. People do really silly things on Facebook sometimes. We let our guard down and we think we could just put anything out there because it's Facebook, right? It's social networking. It's not that serious. Well, it is kind of serious. So you guys are in seventh grade, and so you come back in August, you'll be eighth graders, and before you know it, you'll be going off to Shawnee Mission East or maybe another high school. And then before you know it, you're going to be going to college. Most of you might want to go to college. And if you go to college, you might want to think about what's out there about you online. So Facebook, for instance, is something colleges look at. And I know that because I have a kid in college. And when he applied to college, they, they started following him on Twitter. Uh, they wanted to see what he said out there. And I can tell you that the Facebook people that look at colleges, they, the, 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 the ones that look at the Facebook pages, 38%, over a third of the people said they found negative things about their applicants online. And you might think, well, I can say what I want now. When it comes time to apply to college, I'm just going to take that stuff down, right? Well, you really can't because it could be saved out there. People can copy what you have there and cut it and paste it and put it somewhere else. And it's always out there. 
you lose control whatever you put online the moment it goes in the cyber world and it could be Facebook or anything else and it could come back to haunt you in later years it may affect your ability to do what you want to do you want to be a doctor you want to be a lawyer you want to be a stay-at-home mom stay-at-home dad even those things could be affected by the relationships you have when people see things you posted online okay this is a MySpace page again a social networking site before before Facebook and this guy has it he's right here in Overland Park, Kansas. He's got something that says, I drink because I live in Kansas. Now, all those, all those black, black boxes out there, by the way, uh, blocked out some personal information. But also, he's got some really nasty stuff out there. It's very profane. He's got some bad words out there. So I blocked that out. But he had this site out here that said, uh, I drink because I live in Kansas. And underage drinking is a problem, too. It's not legal for him to consume alcohol. But uh, we'll talk about that, maybe have another day for that. Someone else can discuss that with you. But he's talking about drinking because I live in Kansas. Now, do you think the FBI is going to want to hire this guy? Do you think KU is going to want him as a student on their campus or K-State or any school for that matter? No, he's not representing himself in a very good way. And schools are looking at these pages, too. And not only that, he can't spell very well either, can he? He can't spell the word because. Clearly, he was not educated at the Indian Hills Middle School. Maybe he was out at the Blue Valley School District or something where they don't teach you how to spell correct. <laughs> Just kidding. But the serious thing is, it doesn't matter if he spells correctly or not. People look at these sites and say, I don't want this kid on my, on my, on my, in my school, in my workplace. Once you put a picture out there, it's there forever. Uh, people will take it. They can copy it, paste it. You lose total control of it. You may think you take it down. It can still be found. I'll give you some examples of that in just a second. So I want you to, what I want to tell you here that I think is really important is before you hit that enter key, before you hit that send button, just be thinking about how this would look to someone else, how this would look to someone uh, maybe even months or years down the road. And if it doesn't, you don't think it's going to look good, then don't, send, don't put it out there. Here's a story about a girl who wanted to be a teacher. She wanted to be a high school teacher. So she was studying secondary education in, in her college. And this was, she was actually 27, a little bit later in life. So she's out of college. And she's doing in April of the year she's going to graduate. She's almost ready to graduate in May. And she's out of school teaching as part of her requirement to be a high school teacher and to get her degree. She's got to teach at the school. So she's an intern at the school. Well, at the time she was an intern, this picture was posted by her on her MySpace page. Remember that site a little before Facebook? Uh, this is in 2005. And she posted this picture out there with the caption underneath, Drunken Pirate. And the school that where she was doing the internship saw the picture and said, you know, this is not really a good idea because you're setting a bad uh, example for our kids in school, uh, putting this kind of picture out there. And they asked her to leave the school and not be an intern there anymore. And so she went back to college. Well, she couldn't get her degree for teaching, uh, her, her degree in secondary education, because she didn't fulfill her internship requirement. It was too late to do that. And the school gave her a degree. She graduated with a degree in English. There's nothing wrong with a degree in English, but she wanted to be a teacher. She couldn't be a teacher because of a Facebook photo to this day. That happened seven years ago. And now she works in another job where she's not teaching. Her dream was nullified because of a Facebook photo. She wanted to, a, a MySpace photo in this case. All she wanted to do was be a teacher. Now she can't do it because she put a photo out there. And this girl's a little older as well, so this can happen to adults uh, also. Now, I'm not making this up. This is all true. Her name is actually Crystal Ball. That's her name. <laughs> all right. Now, she probably wishes she had a Crystal Ball because she ran for Congress in Virginia in 2010 for U.S. Congress. And uh, someone posted some pictures that had been taken on face and put on Facebook by her in 2005 where she was had a party. And she was old enough to consume alcohol, and drinking moderately is not a problem as long as you, you don't overconsume. And she was at this party, and there were pictures taken, and, and some, you know, they didn't look very appropriate, according to some people. And uh, she took them off the Facebook page long before she ran for Congress. She didn't want anybody to see those anymore. All right? But someone found them because they had cut them and pasted them, and they put them back out there on the Internet. And when she's running for Congress, those pictures became public. And uh, the people who voted in Virginia didn't think maybe that she should be elected to, be, to represent their, uh, their state in Congress because of those pictures. Again, it came back to haunt her years later. Her dream to be a congresswoman was negated or nullified because of pictures on Facebook. This is a picture of somebody here from this area. This is a student at Johnson County Community College. And I'm going to show you this picture. And, and, and please don't get grossed out by it because it's very natural. You know, she wants to be a nursing student. She's at a, uh, Johnson County Community College, and they tell her to go over to a hospital and help deliver a baby, which is part of her training to become a nurse. And she delivers the baby, and then they take a picture of, 
uh, when a baby is born, uh, what uh, also comes out besides the baby is something called the placenta. It's used to, f it's used to support the baby while the baby's inside, inside the woman, right? And so that comes out, and she takes a picture of that. Someone takes a picture of her, and they post it on Facebook. And the school sees the picture. Johnson County Community College says, wait a minute, this is very unprofessional. You should not be posting your picture uh, of, uh, after a childbirth online. That's just crazy. So they told her to leave the school. They said, you're, you're kicked out of school. So she said, wait a minute, you don't have any kind of policy about that. I want my seat back in school. So they went to court, and a judge ruled on it. And a judge said, yeah, you're right, there's no policy, so you have to let her back in school. But she said this, and here's what I really want you to remember. She said, I'm concerned that my name is all over the Internet. All right? All you have to do is Google placenta. All right? So let's Google placenta and see what happens. And that's what I did. I Googled the word placenta, and she's got her, not only her name, but her picture and all those stories. She's on Forbes, which is a national magazine, Kansas City Star, our local paper, Bloomberg, which is a national pro, uh, a website, msmbc.com, all over the nation, all over the world, people can find out what happened. And uh, do you think, even if she got her degree in, in nursing, do you think anybody at a hospital may, might want to hire her after this has happened? Probably not. I wouldn't if they saw some of this, uh, these things that have come up. So things you do, things you put online, can come back to affect our dreams and what we want to achieve uh, in life. I now want to turn to the topic of cyberbullying, which is also, I think, is a very, very important topic for us, uh, for us to hear about. And about 15% of kids in, in, uh, that were surveyed say they've been bullied physically, physical bullying. But it goes a lot higher than that when it goes into the online world. And why do you think that's the case? Why do three times more kids say they've been bullied online than have been bullied in person? Anybody? Yeah. Because in online, no one really knows who you are, and it's easier. It's, uh, right, two things. She said online, no one knows who you are, although you can probably find out pretty easily. But it's easier. That's the key. It's easier to do. Why? Because when you bully somebody in person and you walk up to them to their face and say, say a bad comment, you see how they react, right? Maybe you see how you hurt them. And then maybe that uh, lessens your, your, or mitigates you from, from saying further, further things to hurt them, right? You see the reaction. When you see that online, do you see those things online? No, you don't see anything. You send a text message, you don't see how somebody reacts to that. And uh, you, you, can't, you, can't, you can get that feedback. So that's why bullying online is, is, can be a lot more severe and a lot more pervasive because people are not seeing those reactions, for one thing. What's this? Bill of Rights. Yes, the Bill of Rights, also part of the Constitution. You're about to say Constitution. Yes, now that we know we can all read, it is the Bill of Rights, correct. Uh, the Constitution was ratified in 1787, right? That's when we, we said the Constitution was officially enacted. And then four years later, they decided to have a Bill of Rights because the Constitution was a strong document, but it didn't say anything about individual rights, all right? We, want, we didn't want the government being too strong and stomping on individual rights. So they came up with the Bill of Rights to protect our own personal freedoms in a very strong government, the federal government. So I want you to look at this. Article 1, uh, the Bill of Rights ratified in 1991, the three big freedoms in our country that we have, freedom of religion, freedom of press, and freedom of speech. And you should be as honored as I am to live in the United States and as privileged because in some countries, you can't practice religion like you want to. You can't write things. If you write something that the government doesn't like, they'll put you in jail. If you say things that the government doesn't like, they can put you in jail. Uh, in certain China, in certain countries like China, they actually look at your Google searches and they take out things so you can't get certain results. You can't learn about the world in China because they look at those results and they, they, and they edit to what you can see on Google. Now, we don't live in a country like that. We have individual freedoms, and freedom of speech is really a powerful freedom that we have. So let me ask, ask you this. Because we have freedom of speech, it's right there in the first article there. We can't abridge the freedom of speech. Does that mean you can say anything at any time? Yeah. What can't you say? What, what's not, of course, you can say it, but are there consequences to that? What's, what, what's that? Back here, sir. Stuff that isn't true about a company. You say stuff that isn't true. You can be sued for saying stuff that isn't true. Correct. Yes? Right, you can't threaten anyone or say something that creates a dangerous situation. Right. Now you can do it, but there's consequences to that. So what happens if you say something that creates a dangerous situation? What's an example of that, I should say? Uh, threaten is like, I'm going to kill you. Well, yelling fire in a crowded theater. That's not protected speech. That's not protected by the First Amendment. Okay? You can cause people to scream and run and trample somebody to death. So it's a safety issue. You're not allowed to say those kind of things. You could do it, but you could be prosecuted for it. So it's not protected speech. So besides those things I just mentioned, is it okay to just say anything you want to anybody at any time? 
No, of course not. We have to think about what we say because it might be hurtful to other people. Here's what I mean. Okay, Lindsay, you're up. Today I'm going to talk about Patty. Patty's best characteristics, she's stupid, stupid and ugly. Everything she does is ugly. Watch her eat, watch her stuff her face. Look at her, greasy hair, dirty fingernails. It makes me want to vomit. Her dad doesn't work, they have no money. That's why she wears that nasty pink sweater. Everyone hates her, even the teachers, and they're supposed to like everyone. Get a life, Patty. Thank you. Whoa. Would anybody do that in an assembly? Of course not. That's ridiculous. Who would go in front of a whole student body and say things like that? But do you see comments like that online? Yep. Do you see those things occur online? And I've seen a lot worse than that, by the way. So people do say those things online, but, but it's just like doing it in an assembly, right? What happens? People post them, they forward them to their friends, and they forward them to their friends. And before you know it, the whole school sees it anyway. So it's just like you're doing it in an assembly when you say those things. Those are very mean, hurtful things. When you say them online, everybody's going to find out anyway. So it's really just like that. Uh, I'm going to tell you a couple of sad stories here, and I really don't like to bring up really, really sad stories, but I think it's important, and I think these people would want you to know that this happened so it doesn't happen to someone else. These are two kids that were cyber, that were cyber bullied, bullied uh, big time. Ryan Halligan was bullied by girls, and he actually couldn't take the bullying anymore, and he took his own life, as did Megan Meyer, all as a result of cyber bullying. It went from hurt feelings, and it escalated past hurt feelings, to when they, they just couldn't handle the pressure anymore, or the... Or the or, or, or all the bullying that they were receiving. You know, you, you may say, well, I'll say a comment to somebody. It's not so bad. They're not going to feel that bad about it because I wouldn't feel bad if it's, somebody sent it to me. But you don't know what else is going on in their life. You don't know what other factors are affecting them. You don't know what's in their brain, their psyche, that makes them, make them take that tragic step. And both of these kids took their own lives because of cyberbullying. So I know no one in this room is going to leave here today and start bullying people. I know you get that message out of me. But just think if you did, not only could they have tragic consequences, uh, but what, how would you feel if something, somebody did something like this afterwards? That would affect you for your whole life, you know, knowing that someone did it because of what you said. These look like nice kids, right? These are, these are standard high school yearbook photographs, right? Look like nice kids. Actually, they were really big-time bullies, all charged with bullying. Uh, let me tell you what happened in this case. This happened in Massachusetts. This is a young girl named Phoebe Prince, a little bit older than you. She's 15 years old. She comes over from Ireland with her family, and they move to Massachusetts. So she's, a, she's an immigrant to the United States, and she goes into the school. She's a freshman in high school, and she actually starts dating one of the senior boys. And the girls weren't happy about that, and their friends, the boys, started making fun of her also. But it wasn't just making fun. They started posting harassing pictures on Facebook. They used harassing text messages and even physical threats against Phoebe. Phoebe didn't know how to handle it, and she couldn't handle it, and she ended up taking her own life too at the young age of 15 years old. Again, you can never predict how someone's going to react to these, these kind of comments. Now, in the, in the charges that were filed against these, these boys and girls, this is actually right out of the charges that were filed against them. In Massachusetts, they don't call themselves a state. They call themselves a commonwealth. Uh, so that's why it says commonwealth versus Flannery Mullins. Flannery Mullins is this girl right here. And uh, I want you to just look at this a little bit because what it says in these charges was, this is the evidence that they used to charge these people. And it said uh, one, uh, one uh, d d d defendant was saying was going to beat Phoebe up. She had told somebody, this Flannery Mullins said she had told somebody that she was going to beat somebody up. And, and no, no friends seemed to help her. Or apparently nobody at school helped her at all. They weren't sensitive to what was going on here, it seems. And they had a vigil for Phoebe after she died, this candlelight vigil, and that was really nice to do. But let's leave the candles at home and think about what we can do in advance before something happens. Right? Let's think about, about if kids in need. And I know, I know, again, you're not going to go and leave this room and, and do any of this behavior yourselves. But if you see a friend that's being bullied, somebody you know, not even a friend, if you see it happening, you know, try to help them. And if you don't want to do it uh, uh, in person, if you don't want to uh, bring yourself into it, you can even do it anonymously uh, if you want to. The Indian Hills uh, School District, Indian Hills Middle School, has a way to report bullying anonymously. You go to the website, and it's real easy. You put in the details here, submit it, submit it. It goes to the people in the school that can help that person, as well as the SRO, which would help you uh, as well in this particular case. You know, there's, a, there's so many ways to help kids, and you just have to, have to take that step. Don't ignore it, because how would you feel, too, even if you weren't the one bullying, but someone did something to themselves, and you could have stopped it from happening. Yeah. Help kids in need. That would have helped, maybe would have helped uh, Phoebe in that particular case. 
So about this time, there's a rash of these things. In fact, uh, this kid's 18 years old. He takes his own life as a result of bullying, as these younger kids did too. It even makes the front page of People magazine. That's how bad it had gotten at this point in time. So Obama, our president, decided he needed to address the issue. And now the president's really busy with a lot of stuff. Right? He's got things going on in Afghanistan. He's got things going on with the economy. He's even getting ready to run for re-election. Even in 2010, he's thinking about re-election. And he takes time out of his day to actually film an announcement. And Michelle also filmed one. His wife, uh, the First Lady, filmed an announcement too. And he said this, and this is really for people that are victims of bullying. Here's what he says. Read along with me. When you're teased or bullied, it could seem like somehow you brought it on yourself for being different or for not fitting in with everybody else. But what I want to say is this, you are not alone, you didn't do anything wrong, and you didn't do anything to deserve being bullied, and there's a whole world waiting for you, you know, filled with possibilities. Remember, this is about your dreams, achieving your dreams, and don't ever take things personally, even though someone says them, doesn't mean it's true. That's what Obama's saying here. He's really talking about dignity, we all want to be treated with dignity, we all want to preserve our dignity, and when someone bullies you, it's, it's, it's not, if you, don't, if you don't accept it, it's not true, and your dignity is still intact. Uh, so I talked about Teddy Roosevelt. I talked about Teddy, his cousin, fifth cousin, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, uh, became president in uh, 1932, and his wife was Eleanor Roosevelt. Now after Franklin died in 1945, Eleanor actually started doing a lot of things uh, to help, especially women, uh, achieve things, achieve their dreams in the world uh, as well, especially in the United States. She was appointed to a lot of commissions, and she did a lot before she died in 1962. And she said this, and I think this is really appropriate uh, along these lines. She said this, no one can make you feel inferior without your consent. So if you receive comments from someone, you know, all, the only way that can take away your dignity, take away your self-esteem, is if you believe it to be true. If you consent with that. If you don't consent with that, it shouldn't have any effect on you at all. Now, I don't want anybody to be sending you messages and, and making you feel that way. But if it does happen, you, it can only hurt you if you consent to that. And I think that's a powerful message. Now, for example, um, if, uh, you can do a lot of things on the internet. You can do a lot of things to make uh, thing, things look like they different than they really are. For example, if I told you that a dog could talk, you're saying, no, dogs can't talk, right? But on the internet, I can make it look like a dog's talking. So here's what I mean. You know that bacon that's like maple? It's got maple flavor. The maple kind, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I took that out and I thought, yeah. I know who would like that. Me, so I ate it. Oh no, you kidding me? But I went back to the fridge just a few minutes ago, and I put something together really special. You're gonna love this one. I took some chicken. Yeah. I put some yeah. I yeah. put some cheese on it, and I covered it with covered it with what? I covered it with cat treats. Yeah. Then guess what? What? I gave it to the cat. <laughs> Let's just want to hug that dog. Uh, you know, so listen, uh, anything, you can make the internet appear differently than reality, right? Make a dog look like it's talking. And the thing about, the, uh, and the, and the thing about on, on, online is you can, you can tell people anything and say anything. It doesn't mean it's true, all right? When you go to high school, you might be uh, interested in taking a psychology class. And if you take psychology, you're definitely going to learn in the first few weeks about how we are motivated in our lives. And this guy named Maslow, he's a very famous psychologist. He came up with what he called the hierarchy of, hierarchy of needs. And he says, we're very important that we, we, we fulfill these needs on the bottom before we move up to the top of, these, uh, of this hierarchy. And then ultimately, here's where you achieve what you want to achieve in life. Remember, you want to be something. And this is called self-actualization. Uh, when you get, you be all that you can be in life. But you can't get there unless you have self-esteem. Because unless you have self-esteem, you, you, can't, you can't climb up to that next level. And what happens when somebody cuts you down, when somebody sends you a message, when, when you're bullied? Sometimes that pulls away from our self-esteem a little bit. And if you let it happen, it can. And then you really can't be what you want to be, because that affects everything in your life. It affects your relationship with your friends, with your family. If you have no self-esteem, it's hard to achieve things. And not only that, you, know, it, you lose your respect for other people, too. And then if you're a victim of bullying, you may be more likely to bully other people. And that's why you should set, a, you should set an example for the eighth graders as your eighth, when you are eighth graders for the next group coming in uh, as well because they're going to look for you as an example. But if you, if you start bullying people as well, then it degrades into this everyone's bullying and you have a situation in your school where, uh, where can you learn very well in that environment? Is it a distraction from learning? Is it a distraction from having fun in school? 
you have tension, you have apprehension, and that's what happens because people are eating away at your self-esteem, and it makes it hard to achieve what you want to do in life. How many of you are in the play? Is your picture up there? Yeah. All right, people in the play, your picture's up there. I heard you did a great job. I wasn't here for it, but I heard you did a fantastic job, and I'm sure you got a standing ovation, right? All right, now let me ask you this. If you were in the play last night, if you were in the play, and at the end of the play, when you came out for your curtain call, if the audience didn't applaud at all, no one applauded, what would you think? How would you feel about that? Would you feel, that make you feel good or bad? Make you feel bad, right? You feel terrible. So what happened, let me ask you this, what would happen if they started booing? How would you feel then? Make you really feel bad, right? You really feel, what'd you think about that? Would that hurt your self-esteem? Would you be able to go out the next night and do it again without doing it, without feeling bad about it? You know, when you bully somebody, when you say things about somebody, you're, you're basically, you're, you're booing them, what you're doing, and you're hurting their self-esteem. They're doing everything they can to, to do well in, in, this, in school, to do well uh, in their, in their, in their, uh, with friends, and, and, and yet you, you, when you bully them, you're booing them. And then they're thinking, what am I doing wrong? That's what happens when you bully somebody. It's just like getting booed on a stage. Now, this can happen with adults, too. This can happen with adults. And this girl up top is a blogger. Her name is Rosemary Port. And she was actually uh, bullying this girl named uh, Liscola Cohen. Model, uh, Liscola, Liscola Cohen. She's a mo who's a model. And she actually wrote a blog. The girl on top wrote a blog called Skanks in New York. And she said this: I would have to say that the first place award for the skankiest in New York City would have to go to Liscola Gentile Cohen. She's just talking about this girl. And you see here it says anonymous. It's an anonymous blogger. Well, she's not really anonymous. Remember, I said people, things you put online, you can. You can find out about. You can find out who put those out there, by the way. But she said uh, she she said these comments, and this girl said, "Wait a minute!" And she said a lot worse than this, which I took off this, the slide. Uh, a lot worse than that. And the girl the girl decided to sue her, so she filed a lawsuit. Remember, you can't say anything you want without consequences, right? She filed a lawsuit, and the judge said to Google where she had her blog. We didn't know who it was, and Google says. Uh, uh, we got to release your identity because the judge ordered us to do that because of this lawsuit. So now we find out it's this girl, and she's the one who did the blogging, and we find out she made these comments. So you can't remain anonymous online either. Now, so adults are doing this type of behavior. And this is another thing Eleanor Roosevelt said, which I think is really appropriate to bring up at this point. She said, great minds discuss ideas, average minds discuss events, small minds discuss people. What is this girl? She got a, what is she doing here? She's, she's discussing people, right? What is her mind like? Small mind, right? Small mind. And you can discuss events, of course, but here's what you want to discuss. Let's talk about ideas. That's what great minds do. Don't, don't talk about people. Don't talk about nasty rumors and innuendo and spread gossip about people. That's what small-minded people do. Let's talk about better things than that, maybe great ideas for moving forward and achieving what you want to achieve in life. You know what a flow chart is? Well, I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you what a flow chart is. If you don't know what it is, here's what a flow chart is. It helps you make decisions. So when you're getting ready to send a message to somebody, you're getting ready to say something to somebody in person, maybe on the phone, maybe over the computer, texting, think about this. Ask yourself these questions. Is the information I'm going to say next false? If it's false, if the answer to that question is yes, then you don't say it. Now, if it's true, uh, excuse me, if it's not false, if it's a true statement, then you might ask yourself the next question. Is what I'm going to say make, going to make somebody feel bad? And if the answer to that question is yes, then guess what? You don't move forward. You don't hit the send key. You don't say it. All right, if, uh, if you move forward to the next one, uh, then you might want to ask yourself a question. Would it look bad in print? What am I going to say? Would it look bad in print later on, months or years from now? If it was in a physical newspaper, if it was on a web page and attributed to me, would that make me look bad and make that person look bad? If the answer to the question is yes, you don't do it. And then maybe if all those questions are answered with no, then maybe you can make that statement. And this is a very simple way to just before you send anything, before you say anything online, think about it before, how it's going to look later on, and if it's going to hurt someone. Anybody know who this guy is? I can't tell. His name is George Brett. He used to play for the Royals. His kids went to school here, by the way, a couple of years ago. He had three kids come through here. And George Brett, uh, in 1983, he had a home run at Yankee Stadium in New York, and the home run was taken back. The umpire said it didn't count because on his bat was this black substance called pine tar. And it was used to hold on to the bat, you know, and he had it too high up on his bat, and it exceeded the limitations that they set in the rules. And no one ever enforces that, but it was enforced this time uh, because the manager complained about it, the other team's manager, and Brett got his home run taken away. And what did he do here? He came running out like crazy, right? 
And what would have happened? What would have happened if uh, if this guy here didn't come out and stop him? What would he have done to the umpire there? He may have tackled him. Who knows what he would have done, right? Um, the home run, he got the home run back, by the way. They ruled later that the home run was was okay uh, and was allowed to st stand. But uh, this is he was making it very personal, you know, and he was getting to the point where this might have been a personal thing. You know, it's not just you made a bad call. It's like I hate you for making that call. That's the difference between making a statement about behavior and making a statement about someone personally. That's where you draw the line. If you don't like something that somebody's done, you could say, you know, I don't like what you did. That's behavior. When you criticize a person personally, that's different. That's when you step over the line. And that's usually when there's problems. If you're watching a baseball game or any sports that you're involved in, it's okay for the umpire from time to time to go out and argue, be, excuse me, the manager to go out and argue with the umpire. You can do that. You know, they don't do it all the time. They don't like the call, they argue with him. But what happens if he comes out and he says, I don't like that call you made. That was a really bad call. Maybe they use worse language than that. What is he criticizing that there? Is he criticizing the call? He's not criticizing the umpire. It's not personal. If he comes out and he says, I think you're an idiot for making that call, what happens next? They throw him out of the game because now it's personal. Right? There's a difference between saying something to somebody, their behavior, and making it personal. When you make it personal, that's when you step over the line. Don't make any of your comments personal. Right? And as you come back again over the summer, how many days you have left in school? Okay, so somewhere between 11 and 16 is what I heard. And, uh, and I counted down when I was this age too, right? I counted down, even in high school and college, I counted down. But here's the deal. When you come back next year, you know, be thinking about having a fresh start on all this stuff. You have a brand new start in August, and uh, don't make these things personal. When you make comments to people, you know, you know I'm not, you're not going to cyber bully anybody, and you're not going to be involved in this. But if you see somebody else being victimized, and set an example for the younger kids too. Help them out if there's a problem. I'm going to tell you one more story and then tell you a couple, a couple other things real quickly. This lady robbed a bank, too. She robbed a bank in Olathe, Kansas, also in Olathe. And this happened on January, excuse me, December 31st, 1999. And you know what? This is a case of perfect timing. It was like a perfect storm. If she got into the bank and robbed it, she was leaving the bank, and the silent alarm was set off. The police showed up, and the police did a great job. But if they had showed up just a minute or so later, they would have got her in the parking lot or got her driving away in her car. If they had showed up a little bit sooner, they may have gotten in the bank and caught her. But they showed up right at the time when she's walking out of the bank, and she sees the police come. She goes back into the bank. She locks the door, and now we have a hostage situation. So she's holding all the bank customers and employees hostage for eight hours, right over into the new year, January 1st, 2000. Eventually, she was arrested, and we caught her. There's a police officer walking with her. She was actually a U.S. citizen, but she was from a foreign country originally. Did that make it change? Did that make it different? Anything different the way we approached her? Did we treat her with respect as well? Did we call her an idiot for robbing the bank? You said, what are you doing that for? You're an idiot. No, we don't make it personal. We treat her with respect. Does it matter that she was from a foreign country? Does it matter what color skin she has, what religion she practices? Of course not. You treat everybody the same, everybody with dignity. She went to jail. She's going to do that. doesn't mean you have to treat her any less respectfully. All right, a couple more things for you, and uh, then we'll wrap it up. In 1950, Popular Mechanics magazine had an article that said, Miracles we would see in the next 50 years. They predicted we'd be eating food from sawdust. Does anybody eat food from sawdust in here? They were wrong. They predicted we'd be cooking on a solar range. Do you have solar ranges in your house? No, we have ranges that uh, use electricity, some that use gas. And they also predicted, and I'll give them half credit for this, that we'd be shopping by picture phone. But we're not really shopping by picture phone like this. We're shopping with TV, not with TVs, but with computers, of course, and not with these kind of phones either. We're using different kind of phone. They couldn't have known in 1950 we'd have this modern device that looks like this so we can walk around and talk wirelessly on it. Yeah, that was the 87 version of a cell phone. And uh, the reason why that guy's look, got that look on his face is because he's just trying to get this app he downloaded to work properly on that thing, right? Yeah. Uh, listen, I want to talk to you about text messaging and texting and something we call sexting on cell phones because this is a problem we've seen in schools as well. Um, this is a kid, 18, who got a picture of his girlfriend and sent it, sent it to him uh, that partially unclothed. And she, he sent it to all, her friend, all his friends. And uh, guess what? Now he's a registered sexual offender. He was charged. Uh, with uh, sending pornography over the computer system, which is a cell phone system as well. And now he's a registered sexual offender for the rest of his life. So he goes anywhere he goes in the country. He moves to Prairie Village. He goes to some other place. He's got to tell the people in that state that he's, got, he's a registered sexual offender. All right. And then not only that, they're prosecuting other kids as well for sending messages to others uh, uh, that can include these types of images. 
don't send anything inappropriate over your phone or any uh, form or fashion because it might end up in places you don't want to see it and also could lead to terrible embarrassment. And uh, these two girls, 13 and 18, both committed suicide. Again, same thing we talked about in those tragic cases. They couldn't stand the embarrassment because they sent a picture to their boyfriend without clothes on and they sent it to all their, the boyfriend sent it to all their friends and they couldn't handle the embarrassment anymore. And not only that, the kids could be prosecuted as well. But this is a really tragic situation. Teddy Roosevelt said, believe uh, you can and you're halfway there. All right? So I don't want, I want you all going to have dreams at some point, what you want to do in your life. And don't let a picture, a posting, some bullying that you've been involved in to affect those dreams later on in your life. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Thank Special you. Agent Lanza.